Today, we're going to talk about the Hakuto R Lunar Lander. This was a craft developed by the iSpace Corporation in Japan, a private company that was landing uh, on the moon. And unfortunately, it crashed. And we talked about this last month, said that it crashed, but we didn't know why. Well, now we know why. There's been a report issued on this. This was really a failure in the overall fault management process. It wasn't due to a failure of a sensor. It wasn't due to a software bug. It was really basically kind of an engineering problem or an organizational problem. And we'll go into what that means. Hakuto R. This is a lunar lander. That name comes from a name of a, a rabbit in mythology in Japan. It lived in the moon. We talked about this before, just a brief recap on the history. It's about a ton, 2,200 pounds lander. We landed into a ballistic trajectory, meaning low energy, to get to the moon. It took them about three months. That trajectory was shown. We went through this the last time, um, going here from Earth in the center to this green line, which is moon orbit. The idea on a ballistic trajectory is you don't do the, the normal Hohmann transfer orbit kind of stuff. You just basically shoot so that you don't really need to burn much fuel. You just kind of, like a bullet, it pretty much just goes the right place, mainly based on interaction with the, actually the Earth's sun Lagrange point. It turns out there's, there's other gravity of the sun that's involved in all this. So anyway, but they did all that. They circularized the orbit for about a month. Finally, they decided to attempt a landing on the moon on April 25th, and it crashed. And we talked about that, but we didn't really have much data on why. Um, the final report came out, and they had a press conference, and we'll go through that. By the way, though, before it crashed, they got some interesting photos. That was a nice one, Earthrise. That's Earth over there. Now, what they're saying is that that little dark spot actually represented an eclipse, that the sun was behind them, and that the moon was shadowing the Earth. That's not that obvious to me in that picture, but that's what they were saying. Okay, so they had a written report, a lot of weasel words and that sort of thing, but they had a press briefing, or a debriefing, as they called it, and this is their slide that they used for that. Most of the information here really comes from that. Biggest issue was the landing site, the target. They had gone through all kinds of analysis and design and a lot of simulations on what it's gonna to take to get all the way to landing on the moon. Near the end of that design period, they changed it and decided to move the target landing place. And it turned out the original site was just on the surface somewhere. This one was, it was inside of a crater. It's the crater on the right there called Atlas, uh, called the Atlas Crater. They didn't really think it through is what really became obvious when, when you listen to the press conference. They sort of say, well, part of the blame is they changed the location, but they didn't do a lot of the thinking that goes along with that. Like they, didn't, they never even did a simulation and it makes a difference because the path is followed by the, the craft as it comes in. It's the white line at the top of that, and they're hit, you're hitting down. So it's actually, that's north, and you're hitting south. And so you're going to be coming in, flying over, and then all of a sudden, of course, the crater is going to open up beneath you. They didn't think about the fact that it's going to open up. It's like a joke in some, some college things, physics or, or engineering, where you say, okay, assume a spherical turkey for figuring out you know, how long it's going to take to cook one. Well, this is, you know, assume a spherical moon. Not the case. Anyway. They had all this topography data. That was taken from data from NASA, from one of our lunar reconnaissance satellites. They have topography of the moon, and this is one of them. This is the path. It's really the same, the same view as the previous one, just you know, more from the side and showing the topography. The white line is the path that's followed, um, except, of course, it's above that. So you come along. If you were following the path in, the craft would go up a little bit, and then, of course, there would be a big drop-off, and you'd find a land in the crater. And that's what they're showing here. So, what were the events? They were flying along, you know, along the crater wall, or before the crater wall. All of a sudden, they came up over the rim, and then, lo and behold, well, the altimeter, which is, they, don't, they didn't specify what their sensor is. I don't know if it's a laser or radar base, but whatever it is, it rapidly changed. Well, no kidding, you know, it, uh, they just flew over a crater. Of course, it's, all of a sudden, here they thought they were going to be 80 feet from landing. All of a sudden, you know, there's another 3,000 feet in there, and what did they conclude? They conclude well, it must be a faulty altimeter. And, you know, this is, there's a strategy, you know, how do you decide when a sensor is good and when it's bad? And it's not actually a trivial problem, but they didn't think about this or they, they wouldn't have done what they did. Anyway, there was a big deviation, so they threw it away. They just said, okay, well, let's not use that. It's no good. And the problem is they didn't have any backup for that. They didn't think through, well, okay, if you really don't have an altimeter, how do you land? I mean, this is a lunar lander. It better be good at it. And it turns out you really can't do it. So there's a, every one of these spacecraft would have a state estimator, keeping track of 
well, where am I? You know, your position in space and your orientation. Uh, sort of really six different variables there, as well as velocities associated with that. And, well, they did, as soon as they said, okay, this altimeter is no good, let's just back up and say, well, let's use our last good value and then just go from there uh, with inertial navigation. And that's apparently what they did. So they thought that they were actually still pretty close to land as a result. Their strategy was when they get really close, it turns out they weren't actually on land when they thought they should be. They just dropped it a meter per second. And so it turns out they're out there over like five kilometers above their spot, going down at one meter per second. They're going to run out of fuel, and that's what happened. They were doing a great job of landing in the middle of the air. You know, the, the, unfortunately, the, there was a whole lot more land below them that they had to get to. But anyway, they ran out of fuel and they fell. And they concluded that's what happened. Yeah. A question came up. Didn't they have a camera on board to do some of the navigation help? That's actually an excellent question. They probably did, but apparently they weren't using it to help in their navigation. Why didn't they use that? I mean, that's an obvious thing. Uh, I was going to get to that in a minute. But, you know, for instance, cruise missiles, they will typically match against a picture. They will have data. They know what the ground is supposed to look like, and you follow your way along with the pictures. And you also have topographical data. So you know what the height's supposed to be. So if a mountain is going to come up, you know, even without looking, just based on where you are, you know you need to go up to avoid hitting the mountain. They apparently weren't doing that. Otherwise, they would have had an alternate source of, of altimeter data. It wouldn't have been as good, but it would have been a lot better than just, oh, let's, let's assume we are where we were. So you were kind of hit the heart of the problem is that they didn't think of alternatives, you know, including, you know, using cameras. In fact, people have suggested you could have two cameras and do stereoscopic, you know, range finding. There's just so many things you could do which they apparently didn't. Yeah. This prompted some discussion with comparisons to the Hakuto R lander. The altimeter is a sensor. It didn't fail in the Hakuto R case, but the problem was that the incorrect fault detection logic declared that the altimeter did fail. With no backup instrumentation, that guaranteed failure to land successfully. Half the problem sometimes is figuring out, do you have a failure or don't you? You know, and is there a failure? And if so, is it a failure of the sensor or is it a failure of the you know, other hardware? Yeah, I'm just going through some of the examples here. But yeah, in this case, they should have believed it. Their failure was their modeling, essentially, of what can happen. Well, if they had adequate ability to detect the failure, they would have, you know, for instance, if you had two altimeters and they both said that, oh, you actually are 3,000 meters above the crater floor, you probably believe it then. You figure the likelihood of the two of them failing at exactly the same time are pretty slim. No, it's, it's a logic problem. No, I think that's super less logical. In other words, yeah, the altimeter was correct, but they assumed it was bad based on their test. The problem was their test, and they couldn't do much better because they didn't have any redundant way. They didn't have an alternate way to estimate their height. If you had two different ways, and they both said that, oh, yeah, you really are now you know, 3,000 meters above the bottom of the land, as opposed to, you know, 100 feet or something. They did have, a, you know, a test. They had a test for, is this sensor failing? They actually had thought of that much. And because they had a test for it, if it changes too fast, clearly it couldn't possibly change that fast. So that test was wrong. So they designed the test wrong. And then the second failure was not having a way to check, a cross check, essentially. You know, if you got two measurements of the same thing, if they both agree, probably you're okay. If they disagree, you don't know which one's right, but at least you know you got a problem. If you have three measurements of the same thing, then you can actually just say, well, okay, calculate the average of the three. The one that's farthest away from the average, maybe that one's just bad. Throw that one out and use the other two. Maybe average those two. I mean, there's a lot of strategies you could use, but they didn't do any of that. They just didn't think it through. Now, she touches on a very good point. There is, there is a cultural difference this discussion led to some speculation in the audience that perhaps cultural factors aggravated the ice space problem, uh, in particular the emphasis on consensus and reluctance to challenge authority, and the importance of politeness to avoid directly contradicting an established company position. Of course, on the other hand, Japan didn't become the world's third largest economy without good engineering. I did some consulting in Japan for a while, and I, I ran into the same kind of thing where, you know, fundamentally, once, once the manager says something, it's very hard to undo that. So the manager said, it's a good idea to change the landing site. And everybody just sort of said, okay, but then nobody thought through, again, what it really meant. And 
Now, when the manager basically says nothing, and he sort of waits for his underlings to speak, that, that's when the, the democratic bottom-up approach can happen, but it doesn't always happen. And they can work both ways. Okay, so anyway, but so back to this one. So, in the official written report, they wrote the software didn't perform as expected. So, yeah, I would say, first of all, people like to blame software in that thing. At least they didn't say it was a bug. I mean, a lot of people in the press are saying, oh, it's a bug. No, it's, it's not. This software wasn't the issue here. The issue was engineering failure. People didn't think through all the scenarios. And it didn't matter. They even did simulations. It didn't matter before because they didn't simulate flying all of a sudden over a crater. So, and you know, that really kind of exposed the problem. The software was actually developed by Draper Labs, the ones in, in Massachusetts, but they just implemented the requirements. So the requirements were not set properly. And the change of the target landing site is what exposed the problem. And it's pretty amazing that they didn't even do a single simulation. Even one would have probably showed that as they came over this crater, all of a sudden your altimeter is going to say, hey, there's something changed rapidly. They didn't, they didn't think of that. Now that was in the written report. Now they were a little more honest in the debriefing. They kind of hinted about several things. They're being very polite and nobody likes to insult their uh, superiors. But first of all, they said basically that there's a project management failure here. I mean, in, in so many ways. One is changing the target and not demanding at least a few simulations to show that it would work. They also referenced something about inadequate topography and that one didn't quite pass the snow test. I mean, why wouldn't it be adequate? They have coverage of the entire moon from these uh, the NASA satellites back in the 2010 to 2012 period. So they could have gotten the same data that for that area. And going back to your question, it is unclear. What did their software do? Did they even figure out where they were on that map and hence have a rough idea of what the altitude should be? They should have been doing that, but it doesn't look like they did. That means they really were just literally doing inertial navigation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Basically, that just means kind of going open loop in the sense that you just, given you, where you think you are already and based on acceleration readings in space and rotation, just estimate where you are. And the problem is when you start off, you know, five miles or f three miles off, you know, you're not going to make up for that if, with no correction for measurements. So what I'd say is in general, this crash proved that they didn't put enough fault, thought into fault management and fault management, meaning detecting the problems and then doing something about them. You know, what do you do if you have that fault? They just didn't think that through. So here's an example, we're talking about inertial navigation. Again, what is that? It's essentially guessing where you are based on knowing where you were at one point in time and projecting ahead to where you should be, you know, like a second later, based on what you know about acceleration, velocity, and, and your past position. And the problem is it drifts because um, you're basing on acceleration. So uh, I put an example here together, just if you were traveling in a car, you know, and you're just in one dimension, a flat surface, um, and say, at, you know exactly where you were, you're at position zero. And, and you're at rest, there's no acceleration, no velocity. That's the, uh, the first line in that table there. The acceleration, velocity, and position are in that. And then right after zero, like 0 0.01, you trump the accelerator. And then you just take acceleration measurements in the x direction. Um, and so it, you just work through the calculations. And you find out, and say in 20 seconds, you ended up going about 380 feet. But what if your accelerometer were just slightly off? What if it were consistently biased high by a half a percent? You'd end up within 20 seconds, you would already be roughly two feet off. And that's in 20 seconds. You know, it doesn't take you long. And, and that's a fundamental problem with traditional navigation. You need to have a way to correct it periodically. It's good for short time periods, but you have to be able to correct it. And that's what they do. You know, if you're a, they use this in, you know, every spacecraft and they'll take, um, you know, they'll take readings in the sky based on star positions to correct their, the errors that have built up. Um, submarines would have to do the same thing. Even one way or another, you have to reach either a known position, maybe based on GPS coordinates or, which you don't have on the moon, of course, um, or you just stop. You know, if you can stop, then you can kind of reset everything. To reiterate why the drift occurs, it's because with inertial guidance, you only have acceleration measurements. So if you know acceleration over some time period, you can calculate how much your velocity changes. You only know that change in the velocity, not the actual velocity. So the best you can do is take your previous velocity estimate, add your change to it, and estimate your current velocity. So if there was any error at all in the previous velocity estimate, the measurement can't correct it. You just have to believe it. 
Uh, this gets compounded because the same thing happens when calculating position from velocity. Given your previous velocity estimate, for instance, in miles per hour, you can calculate how much your position changes in a given time period. So if you believe you're traveling at 10 miles an hour, if you previously were one mile down the road, then in one hour, you know you're going to change your position by 10 miles to get to 11 miles down the road. But any error in your initial estimate of that one mile down the road can't get corrected. So starting with acceleration measurements only, even if they're perfect, you can't eliminate any errors you have in your previous estimates of position or velocity. And the situation gets much worse if there's error in the acceleration measurement. And of course, there always will be. If the errors are truly random and averaging out to zero, your accuracy will drift around relatively slowly, but it'll still drift. But if the errors are consistently high or low, that's called a sensor bias. In that case, your drift becomes rapid. Unfortunately, accelerometers can have bias. So one solution for that is to estimate the sensor bias, but you can only do that when you actually have solid measurements of position. That's the kind of thing that would be done on a Kalman filter if you have adequate measurements. So the thing is the engineers should know this. Now there's usually software associated with this and a technique called Kalman filtering. And the basic purpose of that is to help you balance your models, which will give you projections like that, you know, project where you're going to be just based on your acceleration measurements. And you, you balance that against noisy measurements, your possibly noisy measurements. And so if you believe your model, you don't believe the measurements too much. If you like the measurements, you don't believe the model, but it's a balance. And at least that way you, you, can, you, you don't get too far away from reality. But without that check for measurements, you just don't have it. The coma filter doesn't stop that because there's nothing to balance if you don't have the measurements. There is a concept in control systems called observability, and there are tests for that. If a system is observable, it means basically you have enough measurements. You can even start with bad initial guesses for the system states, like position and velocity, and still eventually converge toward uh, correct values. It's also widely known that without observability, state estimators like Kalman filters will drift. And also, any attempt to control unobservable variables will eventually fail. You do have a control system here. You're manipulating thrust to control to a target of the ground level at close to zero speed. And people have analyzed all this, the inertial navigation systems. They've proved that without position measurements, the system is unobservable. They've also worked out that you can use optical measurements as well as altimeter measurements to get the observability you need. So that was that. Um, it really proved that a couple of things, you have to have redundancy in the sensors. and at least pick a few critical areas. If you're a lunar lander, getting an altimeter it seems like a, a pretty crucial thing to know how to do. So that, that one exposed the problems here. So you have to know how to detect it. You have to be able to diagnose that that's the problem. And then what do you do about it? And the control has to work as well, because you're going to say, okay, I need to substitute for that original measurement I had. Let's pick something else, because you need it for control. You need to control the, you know, the thrust to get the landing right. And they didn't think about that. And as I said, you can't really make a landing very well without the measurement. So, but there's another lesson in there that people have to learn over and over again, that all these failure criteria, if you're going to say, well, this sensor failed, it's based on what? Well, it's based on something like rate of change. You say, well, okay, physically, some devices just can't change their thing. Like the spacecraft itself, it couldn't change its position that fast. It can't just based on this mass. Yeah, and the thrusts that are that are available to it. So, and if you think about that, well, that's that's reasonable. So you could say, okay, well, things can't change that much. But then they forgot that well, the land underneath them that can change arbitrarily fast. You can be going over a vertical cliff, you know, and that's you know an infinite change. And so physics can be used to estimate some of the parameters, saying, okay, I know things can't change faster than X, but they can't control the topography. So that you know that was. Uh, if they were doing other things, or if they were absolutely sure that they were never going to hit a crater, they, they could use a criteria like that. Anyway, after all this, so they do point out, everybody has to put a positive spin, that actually they were almost successful. And I mean, it's really just the last few seconds of the landing that they botched, in that you know, they, got the, they got the thing launched, it went into orbit, it, it came down for a landing, all the stuff was under control quite nicely. They just botched, you know, they had one stupid mistake, unfortunately, that cost the mission. But at least 
they're not going to quit. And this is their tagline. They say, never quit the lunar quest. That was, that was one of their finishing slides uh, in their press conference. So they have missions two and three coming up, 2024, 2025, with really just minor changes. And they emphasize that they're not changing much. They're really just going to change some software. So that, yeah, that's good and bad, because the bad thing is they didn't really talk about adding any sensors. And their fundamental problem is still they don't have enough sensors, in particular related to detecting their, their altitude. And it's not clear they're actually going to do anything about that. So I, I hope they've learned their lesson. OK, now, by the way, though, it's easy to get smug and think, oh, only iSpace has these problems. Nope, not at all the case. Every industry has these kind of problems. And it's a tough problem because you're detecting sensor failures. And you have to distinguish those from actual other equipment faults. And that's actually half the battle right there. And that's true whether you're talking about doing this with a computer or just even have people make these kind of decisions. Either way, it comes out the same. And aerospace is no exception. Uh, they're just as bad at this, maybe worse in some cases. In particular, not having enough sensors and not enough analysis on all the possible failure modes. And I'll, I'll cite aircraft um, as a good example. And you have three instruments that are kind of standard. You have an airspeed indicator, and it's shown in this picture over here. You have a vertical speed indicator, how fast are you going up or down, and an altimeter telling you the height. And we're, you know, we're talking about some of the same instrumentation here. These just are the analog gauges, but uh, you know, you're, that's what you're sensing. And you need to know how fast you're going, typically, as well as your height. And you use what's called a pitot tube to estimate that. So that's, that's this little thing down here, the little red area in the lower, the lower corner of that picture, lower left corner. So the way you do that is you have something that's called a static port. It's just basically open to the atmosphere, where it's really just reading atmospheric pressure. So that could be inside the, an unpressurized part of your airplane or typically just somewhere sticking on the side of the plane. You know, and then the other port is called the ram port, which is facing forward and is exposed to the full force of the air hitting it. So there's a dynamic pressure there. They just look at the difference in the pressure between the two. And then from that, you can actually estimate your airspeed. It's actually a pretty straightforward kind of process. You can do it in a dial or you can do it with calculations. There are some failure modes for this kind of a system where either one, of, one port or the other gets blocked. So for instance, you might get ice. That, that's a very common thing. You get icing. And it might block the RAM air port where the fast air is, or it might block the static port. And you have different effects from that. If you block the RAM air, then if you change your velocity, you don't notice it. If you block the static port, actually that affects not only the airspeed indicator, but it also expect, affects your vertical speed and your altimeter. All of a sudden, that's not going to change much. And if it's partially blocked, it'll just be changing slowly. So you can imagine you got all those same kind of tests you'd have to do here. One test might be, well, what if the altimeter just all of a sudden is flatlined and it doesn't change? Well, you got to say, well, how, what's flatline? Because if you're on automatic pilot, it's probably controlling pretty well that altitude, but it might still vary. It has to vary a little bit for the controls to even work. It's not a trivial problem. Those kind of problems aren't always thought through, and they don't always put redundant sensors in. And that's killed people, literally, both from Boeing and Airbus customers. I know it happened in the case of an Airbus craft. It was an Air France flight out of Brazil. And it crashed pretty much because icing and failure to recognize what happened. And they didn't know what altitude they were at. And actually, Boeing has had exactly the same problems. So it's even a well-known problem in aerospace. And still, in the case of Boeing recently, they didn't want to actually do the, put in the extra sensors or, or even provide decent warnings and training to people you know, about it. So it's, it's really pretty common. They don't have the redundancy built in, and they don't have the logic to, to exploit redundancy if they have it. It's one or the other. We've just covered the Hakuto R lunar lander crash, the analysis of that. There's also a video providing an overview of fault management, also available on the same YouTube channel. Other space related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a web page and also a list of videos at my YouTube channel so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.